My name is Josh, one of the pastors here at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, and I am talking about the Monday of what we traditionally call Holy Week. And this particular scene is Jesus cleansing the temple. We're probably all familiar with that if we've been a part of church for any time. We actually see this happen in three different places in the scripture. We see it in Matthew chapter 21, which is the text I'm going to use. We can see this also in Mark chapter 11 and Luke chapter 19. Uh, the other gospels tell us that after Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, uh, the triumphant entry on Sunday, that he looks around and then he departs and goes back to Bethany. The next day, Monday, Jesus comes back and before he comes into to Jerusalem, gives us this interesting picture of him cursing the fig tree. Matthew, of course, is speaking to the Jews here, so he changes the order a little bit of that, where Jesus comes into the temple, cleanses the temple, and then on the way out, he curses the fig tree. That's, of course, because Matthew is trying to make an impression on the Jews, and so he kind of reorders that a little bit here. But in Matthew chapter 21, picking up at verse 12, it tells us this, Jesus went into the temple of God, drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus actually cleansed the temple twice in his ministry. John chapter two tells us the first time that he did this, which was right at the beginning of his ministry after his first miracle. And then of course here, this is the final cleansing of the temple when he comes into Jerusalem on this Monday. Now, Verse 12, as this is happening, uh, this marketplace where this business is happening is in the temple, but it's in the part of the temple that's called the Court of the Gentiles. And this, of course, is during one of three mandatory feasts. This is happening during the Feast of Passover. So it's likely that as many as two and a quarter million Jews would make their way to Jerusalem and to the temple for Passover. So if you came to Jerusalem the Old Testament uh, made an exception where you could bring your animal. Potentially, it had some spots or some blemishes in the particular animal. You could then sell the animal, bring the money that you got when you sold the animal, and then use it to buy a new animal when you got there to the temple. Because if you brought your own animal to the temple, they would inspect it, they would look very carefully to find any kind of spot, any kind of blemish, and you wouldn't be able to then sacrifice that particular animal. So you would then have to purchase an animal, and in the temple, the markup to buy an animal was, was huge. If you came from another part of the world, for example, if you came from Italy or if you came from Rome, and you had coinage that had Caesar on it or any kind of an image on it, you'd have to exchange that coinage for temple shekels uh, because the Gentile money wasn't allowed in the temple. So you would go to the temple to exchange your money and you would get something like 50 cents back on the dollar. So right away you're losing money, but then you would take that temple uh, money, those temple shekels into the temple to buy a lamb and that lamb would be marked up as well. You would spend way more in the temple for that lamb than you would spend uh, outside the temple anywhere else. So they are raking in the money, uh, these businesses. This is what we could call a religious parade. And Jesus here comes into the temple. And the temple, by the way, was not small. This was, uh, it, it said something like 17 acres. So this was very large. And verse 12, it says here that he came in and he drove out all of those who brought and sold in the temple. He overturned the tables of uh, these money changers and the seats, it says, of those who sold doves. So John tells us that as the disciples are watching Jesus do this, they didn't understand what Jesus was doing. This was a bit confusing to them. It does tell us that after he was glorified, after Jesus was glorified and things went on, that they understood these things in retrospect, in looking back. Verse 13, it says, He said to them, It is written, My house, which means Jesus owns the temple, He says, My house shall be called a house of prayer. Mark 17 tells us that he says, a house of prayer for all of the nations. But then Jesus makes this interesting statement. He says, but you have made it a den of thieves. So on the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you would have all of these people, again, two million plus people that would be making their way to this particular feast. 
and there were bandits along the way, and there were thieves, and these thieves lived together in caves or in dens. Uh, and so Jesus says that what's happening here uh, with everyone ripping off the people that are coming to make these sacrifices, it's just as dangerous as these den of thieves that you might encounter on the way to Jerusalem. And again, the reason Jesus is so upset here is because this isn't representative of his grace, because the grace of God in Jesus is free. Now, it wasn't free to God, right, because it cost him everything. It cost him his own son, but it's free to us. And I think Jesus is making the point that you can't buy the Lamb of God. He can't be marked up, and the temple was supposed to be a picture of the gospel, and interestingly enough, here you have the very Lamb of God himself who is standing in front of the temple in this scene here, remarkable. And what a week of emotions this was for Jesus. You know, um, Sunday, the triumphant entry, it says after that took place, Luke tells us in his account in verse 41 that Jesus overlooked the city of Jerusalem. It says, as he saw the city, he wept. And the Greek word there for Jesus weeping is that he he, he was loudly convulsing. And it tells us the reason he wept is because he looked over Jerusalem and said, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. He was trying to offer the kingdom to his own people, but they were rejecting him as Messiah. So he weeps. But then, of course, here on Monday, he's angry, and rightfully so. He's got righteous anger. Of course, we know coming in a few days on the Mount of Olives on Thursday, he is weeping there in the garden. He's so distressed, it says that he sweat uh, drops of blood or drops that were like blood. And then, of course, we know Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus is a man of sorrow and he's acquainted with all grief. So this, no doubt, was the most difficult week in all of human history, more than any man has had to endure and here is the God-man enduring all of this. And he's enduring this with great emotion and with grief and with sorrow. You know, I just think as we're looking at this, that Jesus has an invitation to us in this. Jesus is inviting us in our grief and our sorrow and our frustration and our uncertainty to come to him. You know, again, because he is a man of sorrow, because he is acquainted with all grief, he can relate to you wherever you are in this season of your life. He understands. We can bring it to him. There's a great promise I love. If you cast your cares on him, you can do that because he cares for you. He cares for you. And I think as we work our way through this week in the life of Jesus, this holy week, it's important for us to know that he did all of this on our behalf for us. So I just want to, on behalf of the Lord, as you're watching, give you an invitation to bring whatever it is that's on your heart to him, to lay it at his feet at this very moment, to know that he cares for you. And again, if you're watching this and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it's important from this particular account to know the gospel of grace is free to you. It can't be earned. It can't be sold like they were selling and upselling in the marketplace here. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross to forgive you. He came back to life three days later to prove that he has the power over sin and over death. So this is a great opportunity this week, Easter of 2022, to say, you know, I don't know if I know Jesus personally, but I'm going to make a decision to trust him as my personal Savior. What a great opportunity. What a great week to be able to say that. So God bless you guys. Uh, I encourage you to continue to watch these videos as well. Lots of great things coming, lots of good content as we work our way through this week.